And the reason we're all here is the great, great Ruth Negar. I always had it in my mind that I wanted to be an actor from a very young age. I fell in love with film from a very young age. Um, like uh, people of my age, uh, the VHS was how I fell in love with <laughs> film. Um, and on Friday nights, my, s my cousin and I got six, with three films each, and that was our reason for living. Um, and it was just the extraordinary thing of, you know, going into, I mean, no one, no no young child knows what that's like, but opening the door into your blockbuster, or your chopper, or your extra vision where we were in Ireland, um, and just seeing this choice laid out. Um, and that was how I felt. I, I think I fell in love with storytelling. And that was very much, I wanted to be part of that world. I didn't, quite know maybe for a while it was acting I wanted to do but um, I think I was Labyrinth that I saw for the first time and David Bowie coming down those stairs Kristen I thought whatever he's doing that's what I want to be doing um, and um, as I don't think I'll ever reach those dizzying heights but um, I can always try and um, but I, kn I was very shy and I didn't really want to go to you know sort of a Saturday drama school um, so I, I think I waited out my teenage years, as many people do. Um, and I trained, I got into, um, I actually applied to go to Trinity College Dublin to do the academic course, the academic drama course, and I got into that. But then I found out that there was um, a practical training course and it was within the umbrella of the university. So there weren't these, you know, um, enormous fees that were associated with a lot of the drama schools that I, I were in England and I just couldn't afford that. So, um, And I knew I wanted to study at Trinity because I knew they had a great um, program at the Samuel Beckett uh, Centre within, the, within the, 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 um, the university. So I got in luckily and I was very lucky because there was a class of only 13 of us and you know my fees were minimal, they're just like un university fees and so that was an excellent three-year training, and I was very lucky to get a job in, in the Abbey Theatre as soon as I leave, left college. So it sort of has progressed from there. Do you think the formation in theatre was essential, or did you have to like learn new skills every time you shifted to a new mode? For me, it was because it gave me a, it gave me confidence. That's the best thing that I mean. Ver I mean, very m many other things, but. Um, it gave me a confidence and it gave me a work ethic, which you is invaluable as an actor. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, I don't necessarily think everyone needs to go to drama school, but I think you need to graft. Yeah. Um, but the great thing about the thing about theatre is it teaches you about just the, the, the basics. It teaches about space behind you, in front of you. You know, it teaches you about um, space in terms of other actors. You know, it's, it teaches you about voice, what you can do with your voice, you know, and, and um, it was never um, my, um, I always, I never thought, and we were never taught this in drama school, that we could only limit ourselves to theatre, and I'm not yeah. saying that it's limiting, yeah. but n that um, you can, there are transferable <laughs> skills, um, it's just that it's just that we didn't have specific camera training. But, you know, these are things you can learn on the job, I very much believe. Yeah. What would you say may have been your biggest roadblocks along the way? Um, you could either internally or, or literally in the field. I think other people's perceptions mm -hmm. of me that may have limited me. And I think I'm not alone in that. Um, I think that... Um, not just as a person of color, but as an Irish person of color, <laughs> people were very, <laughs> how did that work? <laughs> um, but funny enough, that never happened in my own country. You know, I got to play mm. roles. Uh, the first ever role I played was Lolisha in um, an adaptation by Michael West, which was mm. put on by Annie Ryan, who is a native of Chicago and who moved to um, Ireland. Um, I got to play Abigail in the Crucible at the Abbey. I got to play uh, Peggy in Playboy of the Western World for Druid Theatre. So 
Um, I never found it to be limiting in, in Ireland for whatever reasons. I'm n I don't know if I'd have been afforded those same opportunities elsewhere. Yeah. Um, I know that, I mean, when I was fair, when I was starting out, I think someone said, so there was this article in a newspaper once that said, Ruth Nega believes her heritage is holding her back. And yeah. I was like, it's not my heritage that's holding me back, it's other people's yeah. perceptions of what my heritage is heritage means that they think it, that that makes them it's narrowing the trajectory of what i'm capable of that in their own minds not what i am think i am capable of and i think that troubled me for 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 a while but i do think things are changing you know i do i do i genuinely do they they are um but i can say anecdotally i was at a, a festival recently and there was a panel of you know talent to watch and there were three or four amazing talented people uh, three of them were 30 and over, up to you know mid to late 40s, and one was 21. Mm -hmm. And the 21-year-old had been in three major films by three blue chip, you know, art house directors, yes. and the others had been working steadily, but were just now breaking through. And the fact that she was a young white woman and that they were three po people of color, I don't think was lost on anyone who is a person of color in this field. You know that they're just no, no. are certain perceptions mm -hmm. that the young white woman maybe didn't have to, yeah. you know, kind of navigate before she got, um, you know, to, to work with blue chip directors and the others happily are there now and, and doing the same, but there are those roadblocks still. Oh, m most definitely. But I also I think you can't sort of hijack anyone else's narrative and, and you can't also um, project your narrative onto someone else. And what I mean by that is I can't speak for anyone else. I sure. can only speak for me. And, you know, I'm definitely not the 21-year-old. Yeah. Um, I'm 35 now, and it feels like, all I would say is just it feels like that there is, um, there's a conversation happening now. And there wasn't a conversation when I was starting off. And that's very hard to do when you're, you know, you have this work ethic and you're itching to go and you can't even get your foot in the door. I mean, yeah. and I think that's all people want. People just want an opportunity and that's the bottom line, you know. And I think, um, and I, I do, I do, I do, I do sympathize and empathize because I've been that, you know, um, that that person. And you're thinking, oh, but um, unfortunately, that has been the reality. There's nothing we can do about that. But what we can do, you know, the lovely thing is, is that um, loving, loving uh, um, was the first film to be shown at the African American Museum in uh, Washington. Brilliant. No, it was very Brilliant. It was a huge privilege for us. A huge privilege for us. And then Moonlight was the second. It was the night after. <laughs> and it was amazing. And I, have, I haven't seen that yet, and I can't wait. But and, and coming home to the hotel after we'd shown and seeing all those guys and saying hi, it was such a lovely feeling because it felt like, and we we're seeing each other in a circuit, it felt like, it, it felt like something was happening. And that was very important. It's very important for me as a, a human being, but also as an actor. But also it's very hum important for um young people of color in this business to see that happening because um um it's it's just super important i've always said like i've always been quite astounded by the idea that i didn't see that many people who looked like me on television when i was growing up yeah. and so to see people and i'm always quite shocked at my complacency about that and that's quite yeah. sad, isn't it? I think that's really sad. But I don't want young people of colour growing up now to feel that same thing. I want them to, I want them to go, and? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, and I think that we have the potential to do that. But the thing is that nothing is, we say this when we're talking about fil our film, nothing is done and dusted. No conversation is finished. So we can never, we can, complacency is dangerous because it assumes that everything's fine now. And it's not. But it doesn't mean that it's n it's it's not we're not getting there, you know. There is there is room for hope, yeah. and that's what Mildred says in our film again and again: is hope, be hopeful, and we have the capacity to be hopeful. And I think that, but we must we must always be having that conversation and checking ourselves and thinking, you know, um, it's very important for us to see ourselves reflected because what what it does is it validates us, and when we see ourselves validated. It, it, it gives us something, it gives us um, a common humanity that we can all share in. And it makes society better because there's no one left outside, there's no one left behind. Because when people left behind that get left behind, that's when problems start.
and I and it's also just not fair. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Um, you know, with any kind I'm of terrible rambler. I'm sorry. I am no. Irish, so. <laughs> No, I could swim in this. It's amazing. And, you know, with any um, intelligence and luck, I suppose there's still luck, you and the crew from Moonlight will be um, swimming in this pool of conversation and uh, acclaim throughout the season. It's two remarkable films. Um, I do want to talk about um, your, your television um, work a little bit before we shift to Loving, which um, I know uh, we all have questions about. And <coughs> But you're on a show right now that's quite popular called Preacher. We saw a little clip. Got some fans, all right? Thank you. Um, and I wanted to talk about your work in, in fantasy. You also made a film, or a film came out this year, Warcraft, uh, another fantasy project. Um, talk about that spectrum, you know, of, and we're going to talk about biography with, with Shirley and, and with Loving, but talk about just that working in the fantasy realm where you, you really, it's almost no holds. Preachers is based on a graphic novel series, comic book, um, and Warcraft obviously on the, on the video game. But you know, within that, there is just this whole other realm that you can explore. And are, it seems like maybe that's a, an interesting place for you right now. Oh, most definitely. I mean, I love Preacher. Um, it is a comic book I was semi-familiar with because uh, I grew up with a lot of boys who were very into comics and it was always lying around and I was always sort of like beguiled by this fascination, strange thing. But I was always, I remember reading, I love comic books and I love graphic um, novels because I love I love visual media, I love art. Mm. And But I, I, I was, I don't know if anyone remembers this comic book called Misty. Mm. And it was this really peculiar comic book that was like from another time and it was really it was for girls ah. um but it seemed like this some sort of subversive like it was for girls on the cover and then you would open it up and you was like wow this is like not f any f like any for girls magazine i've ever read <laughs> and i just love the macabreness of it and i remember thinking you know girls like the macabre too why can't we have you know why can't we be have the same sort of allowance to to like that um and I think that you know, I think that in many ways the comic book world is 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 also reflecting what's happening as well. You know, I mean, Tulip is very Tulip is blonde, blue eyed, and has really big boobs. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, don't have any of those things. <laughs> and I think people were. I was quite surprised at people's sort of vehemence about their need to have her um, represented so um, accurately and. And because for me, that's the physicality. I think that for me, it's about the spirit of a character. Yeah. Um, and I think that I can, I think that we retain that spirit. We retain that sort of um, misfit, rebellious, um, anti authority, vulnerability. Um, we just made her look like me. It's the only difference. Well, that's actually a perfect segue to the biography section of your resume and retaining that spirit. Um, because it does seem, both with Shirley and then with Mildred Loving, that you obviously honor the spirit of who those um, more public in the case of Shirley Bassey and um, hopefully iconically um, uh, famous now with, with Mildred. But you also bring a lot of yourself. That This is your interpretation, your... Um, your uh, translation of their spirit. So maybe just talking a little bit about um, Shirley, since that was she is so much more of a public figure at this point, what you thought the challenge of kind of bringing yourself and her spirit together in that portrayal? Um, I, I don't think I necessarily bring myself to it because I, I do, I really believe that many people become actors to hide mm. and to disappear and nice that's certainly the case with me i just love this idea that i could disappear into another world another human being and i just found that fascinating and um i i don't necessarily think of it like bring i bring my own sort of of course i bring myself because it's my my body is my tool and whatnot but um a lot of people have said in terms you know of um playing mildred you know you're not american and that sort of baffles me because I don't think you need to be a certain, um, belong to a certain person's um, country folk to play them. It's because if th my job is to play the human being um, and play the spirit of them um, to the best possible way I can. I mean, I'm not Welsh and I 
play Charlie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's my job is yeah. to be the chameleon. Yeah. Um, and I think if if I if I if I am as authentic and truthful and um, faithful to the human being as possible, um, that's my only job, to be honest with you. But it was clear from the clip that we saw, and those of you who've seen Shirley, I mean, you bring a power that is certainly representative of Shirley Bassey's power, oh, but there's a sparkle of something from you in there. Um, and I'm just wondering, is it a moment for you to revel in that, in allowing that side of you that maybe isn't always able to to come forward? Yeah, I, I think I think people, I mean, I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing about actors being shy, but <laughs> <laughs> I did, it, it's a, it's a, so many actors I know are desperately shy, and this is a way that you can, um, you can sort of be that person, that peacock for a while, you know, which is a lovely feeling because I would, you know, even though my, like, public speaking just terrifies me. I mean, you can just see I haven't looked up in about <laughs> two hours. Um, um, you know, I remember, I, remember I did a, a play a play once for the Royal Court with Max Deborah Clark called Duck, and, and it, was f it was a really long tour. It was like eight months, and we opened in Edinburgh, and we played at the Court, and we played at the Peacock Theatre in Dublin. And I had to be, I had to, get undressed fully, get in a bath, mm -hmm. be in a bath for two scenes, get out of the bath, dry myself, put on clothes again. I'd often rather do that again for eight months than <laughs> <laughs> get on a stage and publicly <laughs> talk as myself. So yeah, we are kind of shy. Um, <laughs> but it's very funny, it's, I don't know, it's a, s it's a safe space to explore those uh, parts of yourself that you feel shy about doing, you know? And I think that, um, you, it's this beautiful disappearance and hiding, and you can act out all those things that you have seen in those films, and uh, you know, and you see it in performers, you know, who are these chameleons, and um, it's a very sort of it's something that isn't unique to performers, but it's certainly not rare. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's this, and it's not like I don't I don't feel like I have those moments in life. It's just that um, it's a very lovely privilege to be able to to pretend to be other people. It really is. So let's then flip that and talk about the, the pressure of, of those interpreting, the burden of interpreting uh, public figures, or in this case with, with, with Mildred Loving, uh, historically, you know, her significance is so profound, and mm. um, the burden of interpreting that character and, and really living up to people's expectations um, mm. and pressure that you might feel to to either honor that or create something of your own that you know can be judged on its own terms. So if, if you feel that at all, or if you're able to just kind of let those expectations go. Well, I think often with characters and you know, especially Mildred, I don't, I didn't need to make my own mark. I don't feel that that's necessary because if you, if I don't know if you've seen the Nancy Bursky documentary, um, the Loving Story for HBO, it's extraordinary. Um, I only found out actually quite recently, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, that we both, I'd, I'd known about the Loving loving case, the Loving First Virginia case, but I hadn't really known about this couple. Um, we both, in fact, found out about Mildred um, from her obituary. Mm. In two th she died in 2008. And um, Nancy was so profoundly affected by her and what she'd achieved and so, um, so shocked, actually, and quite concerned that... Um, she wasn't a fixture in our minds. She wasn't. She wasn't part of the canon, the human civil rights canon, um, and it, she felt very strongly about that. And so she went looking for um, Mildred and Richard, and she couldn't find them anywhere. But she managed to find this documentary footage, this archival footage of this couple, that was meant to be turned into a contemporary documentary, but never was. And so she wove that in with this, with a, with um, other um, contemporary footage um, and interviews with people from Central Point and Bowling Green, where this couple were from, and made this beautiful documentary. It's extraordinary. Um, and that was the genesis of our film, yep. essentially. And when you watch this couple, I mean, as human beings are extraordinary, but when you watch them interact, it's like it's whatever energy is between them is so beautifully and beautiful and profound and tangible, their love for one another. Um, it's deeply moving, deeply af uh, 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 affecting. And 
I fell in love with them immediately, just as everyone who watches this couple did. And and you watch those moments in this documentary that um, Jeff has used too. Um, this woman was an extraordinary woman. There's nothing I needed to do to add to her. Yes. She really came came through this th the screen to me, and I fell profoundly in love with her. She's an she is embodies um, grace, dignity, humanity, hope, um, humility, um, humor, kindness, um, bolstered by this extraordinary strength. It's like there's a steel thread running through her spine. And that wasn't actually uncommon for many black women that, at that time because that's who they had to be at that time for their communities. And um, Mildred is, 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 is part of, 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 of that tradition. Um, and so I, I basically just needed to be her, become her and embody her, which was a responsibility and I was terrified of it. But I think that you have to you have to leave that terror at the door because I didn't want anything to impede this me playing her. I didn't want anything to paralyze me or stop me from doing my job properly. Something that I really admire that uh, you and Jeff Nichols, the director, and, and Joel, your your um, leading man in the film, um, did was something you actually described earlier, which was make the love story actually kind of like, uh-huh, right? That you didn't fetishize the fact that this was an interracial couple. It was, from the get-go, something that was beautiful and natural and right there, right, in front of you. It, the society around them, you know, obviously had problems, but there, that, the fact that the choice was not made to sensationalize, I guess, is what I'm saying, that coupling was, was brilliant and I think is very much about progress and is very much about making this a contemporary story where the kids who are watching it today might say, yeah, they're, of course, they're in love because look at those two gorgeous people, so happy together. And then the shock of the society rejecting that is what's so impactful. Yeah, I think, I think the thing is, is that um, for Jeff there and for this, you know, he wants it to be clear that this wasn't, their, their being together and they're getting married wasn't an act of defiance. And I think that's a, that's that's, I think that hasn't changed. People aren't together, f you know, as a fuck you to everybody. People yeah. are together because they're in love. Yeah. And I think it's really unfair of us to go. Oh, it must be because they feel as an act of defiance. I think that's al almost sort of diminishing, yeah. diminishing yeah. people's relationships because, um, I think that's a very sort of a rudimentary look at at at, at love actually, uh, let alone sort of interracial love and. And couple mixed couples, and um, and that was very important for Jeff because they wanted to be together. And I think that Jeff's the line that Jeff's taken is is that this couple did not want to be in the limelight. They had no desire to be the face of civil rights. Um, they not that because they didn't agree, is because they were really shy. They were really reserved, and they were from a small rural town um, in Virginia, and they simply. All they wanted was to raise their family in their home. And I think that Jeff's film exposes the folly of these laws that were extremely corrosive and obliterated families. And when you look into them, they're ridiculous. They, and they are ridiculous. And it exposes this kind of what fear can do. Yeah. Fear, and fear of what, when you think about it? Um, and it's and it's it's that was very important for us to um, to concentrate on because this couple, this ordinary couple from, was according to everyone, Nowheresville, could do that. She could scare the establishment that much. It was extraordinary, um, and eventually take it to Supreme Court and invalidate these horrible laws. Um, and I think that's what people come out of the cinema thinking, you know. They did that. That's extraordinary, and it wasn't because they were. Um, they decided this. It was because they fell in love. But that was their crime. And I think that's what shocks a lot of people who didn't know that this only happened fifty years ago. And I'm glad it shocks them because shock 
agitates you out of a place of complacency. And that's what I think is necessary to never let those things happen again. And to, to recognize that um, these things only happen when we're complacent. Um, rambling again. No. Um, no. <laughs> Look, um, I'm gonna get icky personal right now. There, I had an ulterior motive for really wanting to be a part of this evening um, and to get to meet you because um, my parents met in Washington, D.C. in the mid-60s. My father is a dark-skinned Indian man, an immigrant, and my mother is a six-foot blonde, the trophy every dark-skinned Indian man wants to <laughs> win when he gets to the States, right? Got her. And they had to elope to Florida. So wow. in my mother's lifetime. Wow, Florida. You wouldn't think Florida, would you? You wouldn't think Florida. Not today. Usually. I mean, it wouldn't be the first yeah. place you'd think of. Yeah. That's my mother's lifetime, she couldn't marry the man she loved in her home area. And now her son could marry whoever he wants, man or woman, you know, in this country. So I think the idea, the reaffirmation of progress yeah. is another important element of the film. Yes, because we, we can get cynical and we can get, because we, we all do, and I think especially now, we all get so like, Really? This is, this is what humanity is, this is what we're capable of? Really fear and divisiveness? So many people on that note, so many people have come up, up to us after screenings and said thank you for, thank you for telling our story. Thank you for telling my story. Thank you for telling my parents' story. Thank you for bearing witness. Yeah. Because that to me is the most, Im one of the most important things we can do is bear witness to stories because so often we forget. Yeah. And when we forget, something happens, we, I think we, it's so easy to go backwards. Um, and it's, there's so many people, and it, for me as well, that's really important because I'm a mixed race kid. And you forget that this is, this is part of what I was talking about earlier, is seeing our stories represented. Um, and I think that, I do think that this film really does resonate with a lot of people, not just people like you and I, but people who, um, hadn't even heard that this was illegal ever. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, and I think that, and people are ho horrified and shocked and, you know, and it's, it's not about feeling guilty and it's not about this being, this is another thing, it's not, this isn't just a story for people like you and I, it's not a story for just the black community, this is America's story, mm -hmm. you know, and I always feel like this is, these stories aren't just for, oh, the people that this happened to, it's for, it's for all of us, you know, this is humanity's story. I mean, this is the world's story. Um, and, and it's brilliant that, you know, this, this Richard and Mildred are, are representing that because they represent America. And I do think that when Americans find out about this couple, they're really extremely proud of them. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of them. And I'm just, you know, a small person from Ireland and Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> so as a last question, then assuming the world, everything's right with the world, and you know, and it always <laughs> is. The doors are about to swing wide open for you. Um, what's something, a role, a character, um, a job, a new frontier that you would like to cross? Um, I'm a tourist, so I don't like new frontiers. <laughs> um, um, I think, you know, I don't know, I'm not a planner. It just, it makes me nervous. Also, it doesn't really suit the life of an actor <laughs> at all. Um, I really, I like, I love, I love, I love, I love doing Preacher. I love it, and I loved doing Loving, working with Jeff Nichols. So if I could just do Preacher and a Jeff Nichols film once a year, I'm grand. <laughs> well, right, let's Jeff? plan on lots more of those. Ruth Nega, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. <laughs>